We're Strata. Today, we're going to be talking about our role in the Interledger ecosystem, which mostly surrounds deploying uh, production-grade Interledger infrastructure for other companies. And so what we're going to be covering are problems that companies face as they try to integrate Interledger, um, some case studies of companies that we've worked with in the past and still work with today, some of the numbers that we're seeing in the live network uh, from that, and how you can get involved. Um, after that, we're going to be leading a workshop on deploying Interledger connectors uh, to the testnet or mainnet. For a bit of background, I'm Austin. I'm the CEO, uh, and this is Dino, my co-founder, the CTO. Um, we were roommates in college uh, for three of the four years, and yeah, we're working on Strata today. Originally, we built a trading engine because uh, our senior year, we got pretty interested in crypto, and we thought uh, running a trading engine was a good way to get involved in the ecosystem. In the meantime of doing this, we were going around to a bunch of different conferences, and we happened to meet Evan at one of them. It was far too complex, and one of the things that like drew us into Interledger initially was the simplicity of the protocol. So we met Evan at a conference at Stanford, but um, we were at school at Harvard at the time, and Evan actually lives right by there. So we started meeting with him pretty frequently, and we became convinced of the vision, and then ended up starting Strata. Um, and this is Jeff, uh, our first hire. Hello, guys. My name is Jeff Tang. I'm the first engineer, and yeah, I found out about Strata through an engineer at Coil, Andros, who's somewhere over there. And uh, yeah, I've been here since January doing a lot of infrastructure work and having a ton of fun. Cool. All right. So mission, what do we do? Um, basically, we want to make it so that you can engage with Interledger in a very scalable way. Uh, what that's looking a lot like right now is something like the AWS of Interledger. And uh, in doing that, we want to accelerate the growth of the network. Um, and uh, in order to do that, we need to abstract away a lot of the complexity of the protocol. And engaging with these things, there's a lot of like minute complexities at the protocol layer. So we abstract all that away, um, and then you can send and receive payments through our API. Um, and you don't need to think about any of the actual like low layer things that are going on. You can just plug and play, basically. So we're going to go over some of the problems that companies have faced as they've tried to integrate Interledger. Um, the first being that setup is kind of slow um, in the sense that uh, there's a lot of different tools out there. The documentation is pretty spread out. This is something that the community has acknowledged and we're continuing to work on today. Um, but like originally when Dino got involved, uh, Dino and I got involved, uh, it was even uh, more scattered than it is today. And it took us months to figure out what was going on. We would start deploying connectors and then we would get errors and just have absolutely no idea what was going on. Another problem we found was that setup is pretty expensive. You have to, one, pay engineers to make contributions to these open source protocols, and two, these engineers have to actually implement the protocols. And all that means is there's a lot of opportunity cost for product development. Instead of working on your core value proposition as an interledger company, you are working on infrastructure which you don't actually care about. The solution is that we have a deployment that you can easily set up out of the box, and then you can work on your product, which you, what you really want to do. Third problem is that getting peers is pretty difficult, and we solve this by peering all the connectors in our network. Uh, co companies offer better peering relationships than a human can because they are more liquid, more secure, more reliable. Through these network effects, we've got liquidity and connection density. Fourth problem is that monitoring is pretty challenging sometimes. Production-grade infrastructure has to be monitored, uptime, it has to be able to accept requests, latency, it has to be pretty responsive and throughput, it has to handle a lot of requests. And the solution is that we get calls from PagerDuty at 2 a.m., so you guys don't have to. There's also the possibility that as you're working with Interledger, if you lose some of the data surrounding the payments, you might actually lose that money because you might not be able to settle properly with your counterparties. Um, that's a pretty scary idea. And if you're just building an application, you don't want to have to think about certain things like that. That'll cause you anxiety. So we make it so that any payments that we process are easily accessible through our API. And on top of that, uh, we're seeing some really exciting growth in the network right now, but it's still definitely at a naive state. Uh, like, we're running payments infrastructure, and we're running that in JavaScript. Um, so there's a ton of exciting uh, advancements in the domain of implementations of Interledger. Like, Evan is working on a Rust implementation right now. Uh, the Rafiki one just got launched. There's also a Java implementation. And so we're constantly uh, in touch with the community, staying up to date with these new implementations that are coming about. and. Uh, as that happens, we're implementing them so that uh, all of our customers are constantly up to date, running the most, uh, the latest version of the connectors. Um, and on top of that, sometimes there's protocol changes. So for example, uh, the bilateral communication protocol that we originally started out with uh, was WebSockets. And uh, there were some like certain scalability constraints surrounding that, so we shifted that to HTTP. And our customers uh, got the benefits of that just uh, without even having to think about it. 
Yeah. Just uh, to clarify, you mentioned HTTP. Do you mean specifically HTTP as opposed to HTTPS? Uh, no. Uh, just, yeah, just shifting it from, uh, so WebSockets are basically constraining it from like machine to machine communication, and it was difficult to load balance. Um, and using HTTP or HTTPS, we can load balance. Cool, so we're just gonna talk about our experience with some of the companies in the ecosystem. So originally, we uh, came into this plane to be an interledger service provider. Our paradigm was basically like, okay, there's the internet and there's ISPs, so there's the interledger and there's gonna be ILSPs. Um, so we were connected to COIL and we were also connected to XRP TipBot, and a lot of the payments were going directly from COIL to XRP TipBot. And it reached a point where uh, the amount of payments going through this path actually exceeded uh, uh, the amount of payments that a single machine could handle. So we scaled up, COIL scaled up, but uh, Vitsa, the guy running XRP Tipbot, uh, didn't have time to focus on stuff like that. So the network ended up falling down basically every five hours on the dot. Um, so there were a couple different solutions to this. Uh, we talked with Vitsa about this, and we proposed we could actually just run your infrastructure for you. Um, and he said, yes, like, let's do that. I don't want to think about uh, like managing all the infrastructure stuff. And that was a pretty interesting data point to us because Vitsa has been in the community for years. He's a pretty strong contributor to tools surrounding XRP. Um, so uh, since then, we've started to do that for other companies as well. And through that, he can today, basically, when you receive uh, micropayments through Interledger at XRP TipBot, he's querying our API to see the payments that he's receiving. And um, we automatically manage the scaling of the payments or the infrastructure behind the scenes for him. Um, then there's also Stronghold, who has recently joined the community. And they're offering uh, a really exciting direct uh, fiat withdrawal over Interledger. Um, so that's uh, new, but that's an incredibly exciting thing for the community. We've been thinking about fiat for a very long time, and working with them has been great so far. And then there's also another application layer company, Cinnamon, that is working on a web monetized video platform. Um, and so, uh, yeah, they're, they're building a large community around their product, and um, uh, they haven't really thought much about the infrastructure behind the scenes because we can just manage that for them. All right, so now we'll start talking about a little, about, a little bit about the numbers that we've gotten to in the few months running Strata. The first one I'd like to talk about is the packets per second. This is pretty impressive. We had an all-time high of over 3,000 packets per second, and that would translate to 170 million per day. Now, the, the common comparison is Visa, which, which is doing 150 million per day, but that's Honestly, just not the right baseline, right? The fact that three engineers can beat Visa on a given day just means that they're in the wrong paradigm and we need even more ambitious, aggressive milestones. A second, pay second metric is the total payments process to date. We've done over 5.93 billion packets and uh, full disclosure, a lot of that has been with COIL, uh, but that's even more impressive, right? Because I don't even think they're like alpha or beta. Like basically, they're not even trying. Um, <laughs> so it's only going to get better. Uh, the 170 million per day is is that's just the beginnings. Third metric is the average payment size. Evan likes to talk about this a lot. It's a thousandth of a cent. Again, that's a core feature of Interledger that makes it, that provides for liquidity and security. And remember, again, the Visa thing. They're making they're charging 10 cents per transaction. That's just not gonna cut it uh, for the future of payments. Cool, so if you're interested in using Strata to basically remove the complexity of engaging with the infrastructure side of things and you just wanna build an application on it, uh, talk to us. Uh, we're basically designing this for people that wanna build application layer companies on Interledger. And so we'll be around here uh, for the weekend and you can also check out our website. There's an email on there. Um, and yeah, if you are looking for like demonstrations of what's going on in Interledger today, uh, Stronghold is also here. XRP Tipbot is in the Netherlands, so he's not here. But Coil is here as well if you want to talk with them. Um, so that's basically what we're working on. Um, and now we're going to shift into uh, working on a, a workshop for deploying Interledger connectors. Uh, it's going to be led by Dino. Hey, guys. Um, <laughs> so my name is Dino. Uh, and uh, today I wanted to lead uh, what we call the Easy Connector Bundle Workshop. Um, because one thing we've noticed uh, over the past six months, really, since we've been like really involved in the ecosystem, is that running connectors uh, for the open source community, running individual connectors, that is, we were just talking about the business case, is also really, really difficult. And that's because there's so many different connectors out there. 
um, so many uh, disparate repositories that need to be used to kind of successfully run what you would consider an entire ILP node that can receive and send payments. Um, so yeah, today we wanted to run through a little workshop on how to get a uh, interledger node spun up using this easy connector bundle um, in the cloud. So uh, there was a link sent out uh, surrounding uh, like setting up a GCP account with like $300 of credits on it. So we're going to walk through getting on GCP, uh, setting up an account, uh, and deploying uh, a node in GCP that you don't even have to pay for, Google pays for. Um, so if you guys want to bring out your computers, it looks like a lot of you already have them out. But, um, but yeah, we're going to get pretty hands on here. And so I think the plan is we're going to like run through setting up uh, this. Uh, so actually, it'd be great if everybody could just pull up the documentation on their computers right now. The link is skylabs.io slash mainnet, if you guys want to take a second and pull that up. The question was, um, hosting connectors is not just about hosting infrastructure, it also involves hosting money. And I believe Matt was asking, how do we plan to interact with our customers in terms of hosting a service that hosts money and when would we settle with them? Would it be at the end of the month or would it be uh, sooner than that? Um, I think that's a really good question. Uh, so one, uh, the way we've been thinking about it is, the way we've been thinking about it is that we, um, we want it to be flexible depending on the customer, right? So right now, for example, our relationship with Coil is kind of a canonical, uh, a standard settlement relationship where you settle once a month or um, a, you know, in an infrequent uh, fashion. Um, but Interledger obviously enables this to be totally different um, if the customer uh, is interested in settling in uh, either right now what would be a cryptocurrency um, or down the line if there is plugins uh, for fiat, uh, fiat currencies using one of those. So the intention is uh, right now to use discrete settlement, but you know, as the technology progresses and we build some more of that technology as well, we would like to move to as close to native Interledger as possible. Does that answer the question? Cool. Who here, just to get like a, a feel for how many people have an account set up right now, can I get a, a show of hands yeah. of how many people have a GCP account through which they could follow this tutorial on? Okay, cool. Um, okay, that's uh, a majority of people. Um, there's also the link for the like free credits here on the website if you want to uh, set up the account right now, if you don't have that set up. So we're going to walk through it right now, uh, just kind of like walk through the instructions of what this is going to look like. It's probably going to be faster paced than you're actually doing it in your computer, but all the information is here. And then uh, once we get to the end of actually setting up a, uh, an instance that can run the node, uh, we're going to go to the GitHub here that, um, that has the instructions for setting it up. So yeah, it should be a pretty simple process. Uh, what you're going to do is you're going to go to the compute engine um, and then uh, you'll have a, the opportunity to set up an instance there. And you'll just select, you can do a small, we don't have to have it be very large. Um, and if you do it small, you won't end up paying any actual money. The, it should be covered by the credits. So you'll select a small there, um, go through, select uh, an Ubuntu. Um, yeah, there's like certain configuration options for the instance. Um, but you'll actually need to expose it to the, um, to the internet. Uh, as well, so you'll need to attach an external IP address. For, um, this, for this example, make sure that you do allow HTTP and HTTPS um, because we're not going to be doing HTTPS in the workshop. So then you'll need to attach an external IP address and uh, set up a firewall that exposes a certain port range so that you can actually connect to other uh, connectors in the network. And once you have that set up, you'll just install Node and NPM, and you'll be able to install it pretty easily. So we'll be walking around the room as people are working through this process. And once you have it actually set up, you can also walk around the room. It's going to be pretty easy to peer with other people uh, in the room. You just basically uh, if people put having in their IP installation issues with Git, just so refresh your README uh, right or now, just follow the instructions network, here. We We're going to download directly from NPM but this rather is a great than try to build from to source. Basically, like double or triple the size of the open network. So that's going to be the goal for the next uh, like 
20, 25 minutes. Um, we're going to be walking around helping anybody who has questions about it. We'll do this for about the next five to 10 minutes, and then we'll move on to the next part of the workshop, which is running the Easy Connector bundle inside of that node. Um, one thing I, I want to talk about really quickly is that, um, so there's a few different things that makes running a connector, specifically for somebody that wants to run an, uh, an individual that wants to run a connector, a hobbyist developer, like anybody that might run a Bitcoin node. Um, one of the things that makes that difficult is uh, the DevOps associated with it. I think it's, you know, kind of a tedious process and it has to be repeated and changed kind of frequently if you need to open new ports or do things like that. Um, so that is not what the Easy Connector Bundle addresses quite yet. Um, there are tools for that uh, and that's kind of a, an extension of that. And the other uh, part that was quite difficult that we noticed in running a connector is that a connector has um, you know a ton of configuration options and a lot of those uh, there are sensible defaults beforehand that can be set that work quite well um, for connecting to nodes on the open network so like a big kind of the impetus behind the easy connector bundle was to a set sensible defaults so it takes you know, ideally under five minutes to set up your connector and find a peer, and B, also to make it uh, really easy to add peers or interact with your connector as well. Um, so kind of previously the process for anybody who's done it, you know, you have to SSH into this box and edit your JSON file and then shut down the connector and turn it back on. And if you edit it the wrong way, you have to kind of repeat that and do it again. Um, and the thing that we wanted to kind of do with this as well as a start to the bundle is the ability to add peers live as your connector is running on the fly and have that be added to your persistent configuration. Um, so we'll be walking around uh, as people are working through this and yeah, just flag us down if you have any questions as you're walking through the instructions. Uh, on this image of the website, you'll need to allow HTTP traffic as well, even though it's not checked in that box. <laughs> How come? Um, because right now that we if people are having installation issues with Git, just refresh your README or just follow the instructions here. We're going to download directly from NPM rather than try to build from source. I'm going to run through a quick example uh, running the Easy Connector Bundle and connecting to a peer. Um, so. Um, so I don't know if you guys uh, saw the instructions on the GitHub, but you can start by simply globally installing the uh, Easy Connector Bundle module. Did anybody do the instructions already with the testnet? One testnet? Cool. Um, Landon, would you mind peering with me? Cool. All right. So after the Easy Connector bundle is installed, the first command you want to run is ECB. Uh, is the uh, is you can do ECB dash dash help to see all the available commands, and if you run ECB configure, yeah. ECB configure dash T for the testnet. And uh, the, reason, uh, the reason we're doing the testnet, I know Austin mentioned the live net, but one important thing is that since in this example we're not doing certs, it's probably most advisable that you don't do the live net. Um, and you probably won't find many peers that aren't using HTTPS. Um, so I'm going to pick a simple connector name, Easy Connector. And for XRP Secret, just going to press Enter to automatically generate the testnet address. Yeah, they should they should pick their own name. It's important that you that you select a name. I think it'll force you to once you're running through the process, um, because that name is how your ILP address gets generated. Just use your first name. Yeah. Or first last. Um, so now once that's done, you can run ECB start. And as simple as that, you should see a connector running with two plugins out of the box. One of them is a mini accounts plugin, which is pretty much a local way for you to communicate with your connector. And the other one is an XRP server. Um, that is actually for clients to link up to your connector, uh, not for peers. I'm going to get my external IP address to find a peer. 
You can find that here. So now to add a peer, you want to open a new pane with your connector still running. And one, one neat thing I'll show right now is that process of just running configure and then start actually created. Um, one, one thing as well, if you are just using the browser terminal, you can just click and the like, first button you selected that opens the window for the terminal. You can do that again to open up a new window instead of using it. Cool. So that process of running config start actually created this entire configuration which you would normally have to think about making yourself. Um, and now we can run ECB, add peer. And if I do the dash H option, you'll see it'll give me some information on that command, or add account, sorry, there we go. And so this tells me there's a default plugin configured for XRP already, and I'm going to name my peer Landon. And from here now, I need, uh, Landon, I need your XRP address. Do you want to Slack me that? Also, if you don't want to use Slack, you can just use the Summit chat to exchange your XRP addresses. That's probably easier. So now putting in this address, I'm going to pick whether I'm going to be the client or the server. Um, I'll be the server for this one. And I'll listen on port 5000. And for a server secret, I'll do ABC. So now you see on the left, there's a plugin that's been added to the connector and it's waiting for a peer to connect to it. And I'm going to send Landon my XRP address and the URL that he can connect to. So where it says host, you would want to replace that for your external IP address. Now I've sent that over to him and he can add a client plugin in the same way. So to add a peer, it's actually add account, um, add account. So here on the left, we should see I just got a new payment channel connection. So it seems Landon peered with, uh, with the node. And payment channel successfully created. And now we're going to just try to send a payment. Cool. So we're over time now. So we'll be around if people still want to talk about it. Having a little issue with the payment. But at least uh, we, got, we got a pay channel, payment channel opened. And uh, that's one of the most difficult parts uh, so far on the open network. That's a part that causes a lot of headache. Um, cool. So thanks, guys.